Good afternoon and welcome everyone. We wanna thank you so much for spending your lunch hour with us today. My name is Laura Edmonston. I'm a deputy law librarian for the Washington State Law Library. And I'm also the current chair of the Washington Library Association Special Library Division. WLA SLD is once again thrilled to team up with President Laura Grove and our colleagues at SLA PNW to bring you this second virtual special library scrawl of 2021. We are delighted to be joined today by representatives of Northwest Indian College Library, Shoalwater Bay Tribal Community Library, and the Yakima Nation Library, who will be entering, introducing us to the world of tribal libraries and answering your questions. Following today's tours, we invite you to stick around for the social portion of our library crawl, a time to join a breakout room and get to know your fellow library colleagues from around the Northwest. Before we begin, SLA PNW President Laura Grove and I would like to take a moment to tell you a bit more about our organizations and some of the many ben benefits of membership. The mission of the WLA Special Libraries Division is to unite and strengthen membership by promoting continuous learning, partnerships, and sharing common skills and expertise utilized in specialized library and information settings. Along with events like the Library Crawl, we offer presentations and workshops at the annual WLA conference, participate in career development programming, such as the WLA Career Lab, and we're working on developing additional activities, such as the Special Libraries Journal Article Club. You can add SLD to an existing WLA membership for just $10. If you're not already a member of WLA, you can add SLD when you register for the, for the larger organization for no additional charge. Individual WLA membership is based on salary and you can find the full price range scale on the WLA website. WLA also offers organizational memberships, which includes memberships for up to eight people in your library. WLA membership has a number of great benefits, including discounted conference registration fees, great programming, video conferencing, access to Alki Magazine, job announcements, and more. Plus, you have special access to several great divisions of librarianship, including your very own SLD. So now I'd like to turn it over to Laura Grove, and she's going to tell us more about becoming a member of SLA PNW. Thank you, Laura. Membership in SLA provides networking opportunities with other special librarians, education through an annual conference and other events, leadership development, and industry information such as a salary survey and a career center. Membership in the Pacific Northwest community can be added at no additional charge to an SLA membership. The current publication is Information Insights, a weekly curated e-newsletter to keep members apprised of recent developments in the field. Membership rates are posted on the website, including a student rate. This year, we particularly appreciate our collaboration with WLA SLD on events. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura G. <laughs> we would like to officially start today's event by offering land acknowledgments from WLA SLD at the Washington State Law Library in Olympia and SLA PNW in Seattle. We acknowledge that the Washington State Law Library resides on the traditional unceded ancestral lands of the Medicine Creek Treaty Tribes, the Nisqually and Chehalis Tribes, and the Squaxin Island Tribes, among other Coast Salish neighbors. We acknowledge our shared responsibility to our, their homelands and express our gratitude to do our work where they have traditionally done theirs. Lorgy. Thank you, Laura E. I'd like to specifically recognize the Duwamish tribe and their Longhouse and Cultural Center on West Marginal Way in West Seattle. The Longhouse is near a village site where the young chief Seattle grew up. The SLA PNW community had our holiday party there several years ago, and it is a beautiful building with an absolutely gorgeous meeting room. The facility reflects historic Duwamish cultural and aesthetic traditions and we appreciated the opportunity to support the Duwamish tribe by holding our event there. Thank you, Laura E. Thank you. We encourage you to check out a link that Sarah's gonna post in the chat to a website where you can learn more about your local indigenous territories and languages. At this time, I'm gonna turn our program over 
to WLA SLD Secretary Judy Pitchford of the Washington State Library to introduce our first presenter. We are going to have a question and answer period at the end, but if you think of questions that you have during the presentations, please drop them in the chat window for inclusion in the Q&A. So Sarah is going to be monitoring that for us and she'll make sure that your questions get answered during the Q&A. Judy, I'm turning it over to you to start to introduce our presenters. Thanks, Laura. First up is a Northwest Indian College Library, and our presenter will be Valerie Macbeth. Valerie has been with the library director at Lummi Library Northwest Indian College for almost 13 years. Born and raised in Seattle, librarianship was a career change, and after graduating from the University of Washington, now the iSchool, she moved with her husband and two sons to Libby, Montana for her first professional position as a public reference librarian. Positions in academic and public libraries followed back in Washington State. While a public librarian in Stevens County, she did outreach to the Spokane Tribe at their tribal college library, and later was interim library director. That exposure to the different world of tribal college libraries paid off when the position came open at NWIC. Welcome, Valerie. Thank you. And I will share my screen. And so what I've got is a slideshow that I will talk about when I get myself. There we go. Okay. Uh, so I'll start with some background stuff. Lummi Library, Northwest Indian College. The mission of the library is to support the Northwest Indian College and Lummi community with research informational, tribal, and recreational resources that enhance lifelong learning. Foundation, the Lummi Indian School of Aquaculture was started in 1974. In 1983, the name changed to Lummi Community College, and the library was founded in 1984 as the academic library for the college. Later that year, the tribe decided that having more than one library wasn't efficient, so they created a tribal resolution, the result of which was that Columbia Library is, is the public library for the reservation community. And it's that designation by the tribe that makes this a tribal library, which by state law is special library. So we actually are, we're an academic library, a public library, and a special library. And the building that you're seeing here was was finished in, in 2014. We moved in the spring of 14. Oh, and I'm going to have to move people's pictures. Um, funding. Uh, we get most of our funding from the college institutional funding uh, that pays for all of the salaries, fringe benefits, uh, sort of core costs. The college itself pays for all of the facilities. Um, things like our, our, uh, our office supplies and the statewide database licensing and one other database and our print periodicals get funded out of that. We also have federal Title III funding. Uh, that's federal funding that comes to the college, and then the library gets some part of that. And that's what we get, that, that funds most of the curricular support. We also get the IMLS basic grant, uh, which is awarded to the tribe, but administered by the library. Uh, that's a non-competitive grant. And that's what we use mostly to support the public mission of the library. And from time to time, we get other grants. We've gotten some nice things from the state library, uh, PPE last year, and uh, a couple, we've gotten some uh, professional development grants from the state library. And there have been some other bits and pieces that we apply for from time to time. Next part, I'll talk a little bit about our collections. 
So much of our collection is curricular support. We have four four-year programs, as well as a number of two-year, one-year certificate, um, associate's degrees, uh, a direct transfer agreement to support people for their first two years, and then for students who want to do four years, but our four-year programs don't do what they need. So curricular support, a big part of what we do. And within that, well, in addition to that, a um, lot, um, the next focus is Indian of Indians of the Pacific Northwest, Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians, and then sort of after that, other U.S. and Canadian, U.S. tribes and Canadian First Nations. We have particular strengths in law and policy, in education, in art, and in traditional stories, which is sometime, yeah, we used to call that folklore, and I've become less satisfied with that label. So I've been using traditional stories lately. We also have children's collections, teens collections, uh, because we are a public library. Also because most of our parents, most of our students are parents and grandparents. So we have lots of cases of families coming in together and one parent will be in computer lab and other parent will be with kids in kids areas or we'll see mom with laptop on a bean bag with kid next to her reading something. We also have what we call our historical collection and that is mostly fiction, mostly written for children but contains stereotypes, misinformation. Sometimes it's just a matter of presentation, but it's, it's a research collection, really, not something that we're actively putting in the hands of our children. Um, Little House on the Prairie. I remember being, well, I was actually interviewing for a public library position, and somebody made some comment about where the little house books were were shelved and and said, well, nobody could object to those. And I said, well, unless you're native. And she didn't have an answer and I didn't get the job. So the little house books are really problems for Indian people. And I didn't weed them entirely, but I put them in the historical collection. So if people want to look and see how Indians have been portrayed, particularly in children's literature in the past, this is a way to do this, but without putting stuff in the on the shelves where a kid's going to grab it and read that Indians are stinky and scary. The Vine Deloria Jr. Personal Library. Vine was an activist, an educator, an author. He had degrees in general science, theology, and law. Had his first professional teaching position at Western Washington University here in our corner of the state and world. He later taught at um, University of Colorado and at Tucson. Um, wrote about 20 books and about 200 articles, sometimes been called the greatest intellectual Indian country has ever known. He passed in 2005. In 2009, his widow was looking for, she was ready to let go of the books and wanted them to go to a good place. And there were several places that want them, wanted them, at, were interested. A student of Vine's student then friend was faculty member here, Steve Pavlik, and after much stuff, Barbara decided to donate the collection to us. As it happened, we were in design stages for this building at the time, and the proposal was that we would build a room for the collection, house it all together. So that kind of segues from the collections we have to the spaces we have. So I've got a couple of shots of the room that the Deloria collection has. Now these are 
we keep it locked because we want to protect the books. When we have people in, we want to have a staff person with them. But we do encourage people to come in and touch the books. And in some cases, we have circulating copies. In some cases, we don't. So people can read in here or we can let them take books elsewhere in the library to read. And he had very far ranging interests. Um, actually had folks up from the state library in government documents looking at some of the things we had and uh, comment was made that we had stuff they didn't. And I said, you know where it is if you want to visit it. Um, also, uh, Vine wrote a book called Jung and the Sioux Tradition. And in his research, he collected more stuff on, on C.J. Jung than most people have. So that's just an interesting, interesting collection. And that's a shot of our stacks area. And more of our stacks. That's one of our study areas along one side of the building. More study space on the other side of the building. Soft furniture down one end of the building. More soft furniture. We've got two study rooms, and these have um, audio and video playback, so DVD, VHS, CD, and cassette. Um, the monitor is one you can plug a computer into for group work. Um, so these can be used by people doing group work together, or if somebody wants really quiet space, they are reservable. So that's something where we've, and we've got two of these rooms. Computer lab, we've got uh, four computers reserved for community members. And for a lot of community members, this is where they get their internet access. It's one of the things that was hard about being closed, but they're coming back. Then the rest of them are reserved for students and they've got, you know, internet office suite, email, connect to a printer that's out in our main area. Uh, kids area. Uh, the, the totem poles are sun and moon and raven and were commissioned by a previous librarian for the old building. Oh, and that's Billy Frank Jr. It was a state library poster up in the corner. And now non-public area, this is our staff workroom. We have a staff workroom. That was a big improvement from the old building and something that, that not every library has. And we've got a break room. Now we share our building with IT. So uh, it's more than just library staff, but we all share the break room. And, oh, I wanted to mention uh, a collaboration that we've got. Whatcom Libraries Collaborate. Uh, two public libraries, Bellingham Public, Whatcom County, Academic Libraries, Bellingham Technical College, Whatcom Community College, Western Washington University, and us. If you have borrowing privileges at any one of those libraries, you can get borrowing privileges at any of the others. So you can borrow from any library, you can return to any library, including the book drops, and they will get home. We have a vice president who teaches a class at Western once a year. He brings his students out three times during the quarter usually. They borrow books. They can return them at their own library. They don't have to come back to return the books. So that's, and having publics work together that way is pretty common, having academics work together that well, pretty common, having the academics and publics less common. And I'm the only one, we're the only one that I know of that's academic, public, and tribal. So I have to brag about that. And part of that is what we call our Whatcom connection. So people that have public library cards and you can apply for them online, you don't even have to go in, can help place holds on materials and have them delivered here, check them out here so you don't have to go into any of the other towns to get public library materials. 
the thing that's really cool about that for me is that I can concentrate on our strengths and I don't have to worry about buying bestsellers and really popular materials because people can get at them this way. And that's my slideshow. Uh, I'm not sure where your camera is. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really happy to have been invited to do this and my contact information is down in the corner if you'd like to get in touch. Valerie, thank you so much for sharing your library with us and uh, the wonderful photos. If, again, just want to remind everybody, if you have any questions, we are monitoring the chat. So if you think of questions during our presentations, just drop them in the chat and then we will do a formal Q&A at the end. So next, Judy is going to um, introduce us to our presenters from the Shoalwater Bay Tribal Community Library. Thanks, Laura. Um, from Shoalwater Bay Tribal Community Library, we have uh, Christine Torset. She is a tri tribal member with a pre-law higher education background that moved the community to the community 10 years ago. She was hired in 2020, tw excuse me, 2012 as an intern for the tribe where she spent a majority of, majority of her time in the library. Her grandma taught her to read by the time she was three years old so that naturally instilled a love of reading and learning in her. In 2018, she was hired as the new museum curator working alongside the librarian at the Shoalwater Bay Tribal Community Library. Then in late 2019, she was made the cultural specialist, and she still gets to work in their beautiful museum and library. It, is, it takes a deep knowledge and understanding of Christine's tribe's history to work in their library because it's a knowledge hub for their rural area community. We also have Mary Johnson, who is also a tribal member and was hired as a museum curator in 2019 after completing four years at the University of Oregon. As a kid, she spent her free time reading books and as a college student enjoyed studying in the campus library, hidden in the tall stacks of books. Since being hired, she has spent a lot of time going back and forth between the museum and library, working alongside the librarian and cultural specialist, and has learned a lot. It takes an appreciation of literature and knowledge of the tribe's history to work in her library because it's important to improve the diverse resources for their community needs. Welcome, Christine and Mary. Sanatsti, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I apologize uh, right off the bat. I had some te technical difficulties with my presentation. Uh, I discovered when I got to work that the website that I was using for it is blocked. So I had to quickly put together some pictures for you all. And um, But it's kind of a reflection of our very small and humble tribe. Uh, we have less than uh, 400, or no, we have just about 400 tribal members and about 80% of them live across the United States. Uh, we don't have very, there's only maybe um, 80 tribal members that live on the reservation. Um, our library uh, services those tribal members as well as the surrounding community. Uh, the other nearest library is about 25 minutes away from us in either direction. And both of those are Timberland libraries. Uh, we've partnered with Timberland so that um, <clears throat> we could offer um, their services uh, such as uh, book loans and uh, things like that, um, program sharing um, to benefit our tribal community. And um, we've also, uh, people are able to put our uh, tribal books on hold and uh, when they check them out and they take them elsewhere, they're able to drop them in a Timberland box and the, they make their way home. Um, I just wanted to say a real quick fun fact. I attended Northwest Indian College and that's where I got my um, associate's degree. Um, in 2003, I was the only Indian law student um, for a year before they took the program away. <laughs> and so it was just kind of one of those things that happened that kind of started to lead me here. Um, you know, I had my life mapped out and then things changed for me and uh, the universe had a different plan. But uh, I will start sharing my screen. Um, 
uh, in 2005 is when our original library uh, was started. Um, the chair of our tribe, Charlene Nelson, uh, she was very passionate about having a library for our community. And that finally came to fruition in 2005 where uh, they added a small library at the one end of the education building that was next, that's next to our tribal center. And uh, the library was in that small space for about 12 years. And um, <clears throat> we realized that we were very quickly outgrowing that space. Uh, there wasn't any room for us to have programs. Um, there was barely enough room for the stacks and for people to walk around and um, browse the books. And um, the education and culture department had always had the dream of adding a museum, a culture museum to the library. And so after some negotiating with the tribes enterprise board, we were able to move into a space um, that's across from the casino next to the gas station. Uh, there's a local restaurant that's right above us. And so um, we were moved about half a mile um, down the road. And so it's uh, it works out easier for us because the main highway is right here. And so people are able to see us before you kind of had to be in the know to find out where the library was. Um, <clears throat> usually it was just um, our community members and patrons that uh, would utilize the library. And now we are able to um, catch the tourists that are coming through and um, just have a face out here um, in the community. Uh, so in 2017, we moved uh, the library over into the new space and were able to um, add the museum aspect. Um, <clears throat> the welcome sign that you see in the first picture is the um, sign that's right by the building, by the highway, as you're coming through the reservation. And that was carved by the culture director and head carver, Earl Davis. Um, <clears throat> he carved that special for the facility. And uh, uh, its representation is uh, of our people being descendants of Lower Chehalis and Lower Chinook people, uh, the art style. Uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, we were honoring uh, both areas that our people were coming from and um, because our area has a particular art style. And then uh, the next picture is um, the front of the building, um, our sign there um, underneath the restaurant and above um, <clears throat> where the museum and library is. And then I kind of wanted to capture a little bit of the artwork that we had um, put on the windows to kind of draw people's attention toward where our building is. And then just some more of the artwork that we had put there. Um, we're um, a canoe tribe that uh, Captain Swan had been quoted that if we weren't uh, being rained on or in the water, we were on the water. And so this was just a representation of that quote that uh, honoring that uh, us being canoe people. <clears throat> and then as you walk in, um, this is uh, the first part of the museum uh, where uh, we have, uh, contemporary art, um, carved bowls and spoons and things like that, as well as um, archeological material that was found in a dig in uh, one of our uh, traditional villages down the road. <clears throat> and then the, this next picture is as you're coming around the corner and starting to head into where the library is. Um, this canoe that we have on display here and the picture, um, the picture is um, an Edward Curtis photo of our people uh, while they were in Bay Center just across the bay. And the canoe that is on display is probably one of the canoes in the picture. The, that canoe is um, just over uh, 300 years old. And then we also have um, on display our 
um, our style paddles that are particular to our area. And then the next picture is you're entering the library. Um, we're very proud of the fact that we were able to purchase stacks that we can move <laughs> that have wheels on them. Um, that was really important to us so that we could move things around if we felt like the room was getting stagnant or if we um, wanted to do programs and needed the space. Um, the museum and library, we are hoping to, uh, for it to become a cultural hub as well as a knowledge hub for the rural community. And so I'm planning to do a lot more cultural activities. And so the room to spread out is going to be very helpful. Um, <clears throat> and here's another picture of our stacks. Uh, we offer um, children's books, fiction, nonfiction. Uh, we have a, a bit of a historical section uh, that's uh, specific to our area. Um, we also have reference materials. And then um, we've been uh, complimented many times on our native um, section. Uh, <clears throat> we have a lot of books uh, by native authors or that are about native people that are very hard to find usually. And a, a lot of them are about Pacific Northwest Indian people. Um, <clears throat> we've been very specific about the type of material that we offer as well. Um, <clears throat> there's very little information out there about um, our tribe in general. And so we try to be mindful of that, that we're not spreading any other, um, you know, that we're being true to uh, people's history and their stories. <clears throat> Here is uh, another space in the library. It's kind of been our study space, um, our gathering meeting space, our media space. Um, I just installed the curtains that you see back there and I'm really excited to start having movie nights. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and then also you can see some more of the carvings that are on display for the museum. Uh, we were awarded uh, virtual reality equipment that um, the tribal youth really, really enjoyed using and learning from. And uh, we also have two patron computers that you don't see here. Um, <clears throat> we kind of have to move things around and rethink all of that because of COVID. Uh, we've had to try to um, think outside the box and how we were going to offer our services again and still be safe. And then this picture is just a picture of a program that we had. Um, it's just a nice picture that shows that we could move the stacks back and um, the diversity in programs that we have. Um, this was a, a maritime not making class and um, people, you know, because of where we are, people that went over really well. And we tried to uh, provide opportunities for things like that for the non-native community as well as the native community um, common interests. <clears throat> and then this is just another fun picture. This is my son, uh, the Knights of Veratus program. And uh, it's just nice to show that we were able to completely move the stacks for that program and that they were able to swing their sword around and do all that kind of fun stuff. Um, during the program. <clears throat> and it's just really nice to be able to do that, to not be held to the uh, room looking like a, a you know, specific um, layout. Okay. Mary, do you have anything to add? I think you about covered everything wonderfully. Um, I think maybe the only thing I'd add is that we're trying hard to integrate both the museum and library so that some of, sorry, my son is home with me, so that um, maybe we have some local art in the library as well as the museum, just so it's representational of, you know, both the museum and library being under the same roof. Thank you. And I apologize again for my presentation not working out, but that just means you have to come and see it for yourself. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much, Christine and Mary. 
Um, and again, we'll get to your questions at the end. Um, we really appreciate your presentation and I definitely uh, wanna come over and see your library, see everybody's library. So our next presenters are from the Yakima Nation Library. Judy, would you please introduce um, Marita and Michael? Sure will. Uh, so from Yakima Nation Library, we have Marita Kipp. Um, she is a Confederated Salish and Kootenai, and I apologize if I mispronounced things here. I meant to look everything up to be proper and missed that one, so sorry. Uh, she's a tribes member. Uh, she has a BS in computer science, master's in library and information science, a master's in information and administrative management, Microsoft Office specialist master. I know who I'm going to and I need help. I'll tell you that right now. Um, uh, 2016, as the library administrator of the Yakima Nation Library, she seeks out grant funding, oversees the library collection, and implements programming, advocates and seeks solutions to, prov to provide opportunities for the surrounding community to move beyond the digital divide and achievement gap. A college internship led her to a career in tribal librarianship. <clears throat> Each tribal library is unique, and, and it is important to know the community. And we also have Michael, and Michael, I'm going to let you let everyone know about your name because I do not want to do disservice to it. Um, but Michael is an artist and storyteller. Um, he is committed to sharing the stories of his people, past and present. Community advocate and con conduit to creativity. His goal is, as an artist is to empower the community through art, media, and community healing. Currently, he operates as a media consultant and multimedia specialist for Yakima Nation Library. Welcome, Marita and Michael. And uh, my name is uh, Michael Sikakwaktiwa. It's a Hopi last name, um, but I'm enrolled Yakima tribal member. So I think um, what happens next, we prepared a video for you. Uh, for all the uh, viewers here. Is there anything that you'd like to say before we start, Marita? Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I think what we'll do is we'll, our video is uh, more visual, just showing the library. Uh, we offer a variety of services. Um, so maybe afterwards, um, Michael and I can expand on um, some of the things that you'll see in the video. Sounds good. And um, yeah, so I'll go ahead and um, get started with the uh, screen share. I think I have that part practiced earlier. Everybody see that, are we good? Cool, all right, so I hope there's sound. That's the one thing I always worry about. And I'll be watching the, the reactions of everybody of saying there's no sound. So I'll just be ready for that if that happens. Here we go. It shall be the mission of the Confederated Tribes and Bands of the Yakima Nation to safeguard, protect, secure rights, privileges, and benefits guaranteed to the members of the Yakima Indian Nation by the Treaty of June 9, 1855, for all time. Our goals at the Yakima Nation Library include connecting our patrons globally via the internet address reading literacy and digital literacy, assist in cultural reclamation of tribal history, to also conserve, record, and catalog resources for all people. It is the mission of Yakima Nation Library to encourage lifelong learning and promote cultural awareness utilizing current technology. Thank you. 
There we are. Okay, so that was our uh, video. And then just to kind of expand on the first two um, tribal libraries, we do have some um, similarities and then some of our things are specific to um, Yakima Nation. So we have library staff, uh, we have two uh, library technicians and they do the storytelling. Well, a lot of the um, tribal libraries, you'll find that we, we wear uh, multiple hats. Um, so even myself, I'll do um, technical support, grant writing, um, sometimes run the circulation desk. Um, we do all kinds of things. So. And Michael, you know, he does the same thing. So we all do like multiple things. So, um, but my main thing is um, overseeing the library and seeking out grant funds and getting uh, programming going for our library. But our two library technicians, they do um, multiple things, but their emphasis is um, maintaining the collection. Uh, they do storytelling and cultural presentations. Uh, where our campus is, is um, we're on, we're next to a museum, a gift shop, a theater, um, a museum. Then we have the big building you saw in the video that was in the um, center is called the Winter Lodge. And that's just like a little conference uh, meeting area that um, people can reserve and have events or what have you. Um, Marita, if I may, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about the history of this, this campus. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ahead. And it's one thing that I forgot to put in the video, too. Um, there was a silent movie star by the name of Nepo Strongheart, whose idea was to revitalize uh, our Yakima Nation. He was an adopted tribal member from White Swan and went on to become a movie star. And he performed in the, uh, the Wild West shows of the day in the 1930s in silent films and um, wanted to uh, bring enterprise and, and uh, stability, economic stability to the area by uh, dreaming up this campus and which was put up in the, I think the early 80s, 1987, I think is when they opened up finally. But it was his idea to have the movie theater, the museum, the gift shop, all connected in this campus. And um, this library houses uh, his personal collections of uh, old sheet music scripts and, and his own personal collection of books. That's a good boy. Now yeah. wait. So yeah, that, that was always my entryway. And that was, when I learned that, that was the coolest thing. So I always like to talk about that too. Okay, um, so going back to um, what we were talking about, like our services, um, Michael, he's the multimedia specialist. So um, what his um, thing is to um, conserve, um, preserve uh, things that relate to Yakima Nation history. So he does some like um, interviews, documentaries, things like that. Um, we have um, schools that visit from um, neighboring communities. So they'll go through the library for storytelling. They'll go through the museum. When the restaurant was open, they would do fry bread tasting. And um, so we get to see a lot of uh, students and uh, people come from a variety of different countries. So they'll do the storytelling. And then uh, one uh, documentary that Michael did was about the Yakima Nation plague. So people sit down and they'll learn exactly how the Yakima Nation flag was designed. Um, 
We have computer classes. So we have a computer specialist. Um, she teaches computer classes and we also participate in the Washington State Library, um, Microsoft Imagine Academy, the Microsoft Office certifications, um, the LinkedIn Learning. And we recently became a partner with Washington State Library for the North Star Digital Literacy Program. Uh, we do summer reading programs through the collaborative uh, summer reading. We're a, part of, we're a partner with the Washington State University uh, Plateau People's Portal. So we upload and um, try, it's just to uh, conserve a lot of the historical documents and things in an online digital platform which with everything that has uh, been going on with the pandemic, um, we found that would be very useful to have an alternate point of access for those materials. And we are still closed, so um, we haven't officially opened right now. It's just only staff um, here in the library. Um, we do have um, different things that we got funded through IMLS, um, Washington State Library. And most recently, we've been funded through the um, American Library Association to be a part of the Libraries Build Business uh, cohort. So um, there's another library in Washington State that was selected and they're, they're from uh, Spokane. So we're a cohort that is um, called Libraries Build Business and we're seeking out ways to um, provide programming in libraries to um, help patrons um, build business. So there is, um, I don't know what the, there's a Slack group that anyone who's interested in learning how to, um, how this cohort is progressing and um, ideas or things that you wanna gain from uh, providing uh, business programming in your library you know, it's going to be an open community. And through the cohort, the plan is to have a playbook that other libraries can utilize to um, implement small business entrepreneur programming for your community. So that's the project that we are currently working on. Um, we do a lot of things. So if I miss some things or if you have any um, uh, things you want to collaborate on. We're always open to, um, you know, do any partnerships or any kind of, uh, you know, programming or assist in any way that we can with presentations or whatever. So we don't have our contact information listed anywhere, but I'm sure that um, we can get it to you if you ask uh, one of the moderators. <laughs> But thank you. Thank you for your time and uh, listening about our library. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting us and we love sharing. And um, I, I look forward to seeing all the other presentations. And uh, every time I visit a new city, oops, the first place I go is the library. So now there's a few more libraries in my uh, destination list. Same here, same here. Well, Marita, Michael, Mary, Valerie, and Christine, we wanna thank you so very much for your time and for your amazing library tours and um, introducing us to the world of tribal libraries. Um, we're going to offer our guests an opportunity to ask questions of you now. Um, so we do have some questions that I saw posted in the chat. Sarah is going to guide us through um, those questions and then um, please raise your hand uh, either physically or um, using your raise your hand button here um, on Zoom and we will get to your questions. So Sarah, do you want to lead us off with some of the questions in the chat? Sure, I'll just sort of go in, in order in which they came in and kind of go down the line here. So Great. first Great. question came in during Valerie's presentation. Um, and the question was, what kind of content is your traditional stories collection, like print materials, audio, video, some mix of those? Yes. <laughs> um, for local materials, a librarian, actually our first librarian, got 
several grants for literacy and did got tribal storytellers to and and she recorded them so there were video recordings there are audio recordings there are print transcripts and we're working on preserving those things so we've got that stuff for local and then we've got we collect pretty widely in folklore of of other areas so that's mostly print stuff but local stuff we've got some some video and audio recordings as well nice Okay, the next question also came in uh, during Valerie's presentation, but um, other panelists are, can feel free to chime in on any of the questions as well. Um, uh, it starts with a comment. I love that you have a space for books like the Little House books that keep them in the collection for research and historical context, but doesn't have them with the active browsing collection for kids. Do you have any recommendations or suggestions for public non-tribal libraries uh, for how to handle those sorts of materials? That's really a tough one because you know, I one place um, somebody said, "Oh, but that's labeling." Well, yeah, it is, and public libraries have kind of a different responsibility than tribal libraries. I would suggest uh, book lists, maybe, maybe book lists of good stuff that is is good representations of tribal peoples um i know that people still love the little house books and if you if you just took them away altogether people would not be happy so some kind of guidance whether it's it's book lists or talking to parents um but the whole thing of, of, you know, freedom to read. It's not an easy question. It's not an easy thing to deal with. Thanks. Does anyone else want to chime in? Um, I would just add, like to add that um, a good resource is Debbie Reese's blog, American Indians in Children's Literature. And um, yeah. she, she um, you know, provides great insight on how to handle those situations and um, titles. Um, she provides great book lists of um, titles that are accurate and represent Native Americans appropriately without the stereotypes and uh, romanticized mythology and things that, um, has um, tribes, you know, people been perceived in stories. So um, yeah. So one of the things I think uh, she always just recommends pulling them or if things were like edited or blacked out um, in books, then there's like some kind of note below saying like when, you know, it was identified as something that wasn't factual or, you know, representative of the tribes, but she, you know, she does a great presentation on Little House, um, on Little House on the Prairie books and other books that, um, you know, have um, misrepresentation. So it's a great resource. Um, I don't know if Sarah can find the link to it, but <laughs> but it's I, I put it in the chat. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Okay, um, next question. Um, this was also for Valerie, but uh, again, anyone could um, answer this question. Um, do you have tribal newspapers in your collection? Some. Uh, mostly tribes choose to send their newspapers to us. I have sometimes, at request of students, for example, emailed for tribal newspapers, and sometimes I get them and sometimes I don't. But yeah, we've got some. We do as well. Um, we have a few tribal organizations that will send us their newsletters or their newspapers. Um, unfortunately, if they get like magazines, if they get to be too old, we kind of just uh, put them in the um, archive um, section if people are interested.
We also have tribal newspapers and then uh, Yakima Nation, they, they have their um, own tribal newspaper. And that's one of the projects that we're working on is um, getting the archived uh, tribal newspapers into the Plateau People portal so that um, people can explore them. Because um, here, the tribal community, they, they like to, um, you know, go through the boxes and just like read like, you know, events that happened in the 70s. So we thought putting them into a digital format would also help transition those people that are reluctant to uh, get on the computer and, you know, go through digital files. So um, yeah, it's a great resource. Nice. Uh, the next question also came in during Valerie's presentation, and I'm not sure what it means specifically. The question is, what is your online library system? So I'm not sure if they're asking about your catalog or... Um, the ILS. Yeah. 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 We use Evergreen. It's open source. Uh, we've been on it for 10 years. At the time, I think it was the right decision. I'm not sure if I were going to change now, I would go to Evergreen. I might go to Koha. Evergreen is really good for consortia, but when we when we chose that, Koha could not be locally hosted and still buy support for it, and Evergreen could. Now that's not true anymore. But okay, so open source, it does more than we need it to do, but it does do what we need it to do. We unfortunately don't have um, online or digital access to our materials. Um, <clears throat> being in a rural area, um, it's kind of hard to offer that. Um, our um, broadband isn't the greatest anyway, and so a lot of people just, uh, they don't bother. Um, we realized this whole year during COVID that um, people, uh, even when we were open on a limited basis, people weren't utilizing our library. And I think that was a big hindrance is that they weren't able to browse our collection online. And um, I think I gave my IT department a bit of a heart attack asking if we could put it on there. Um, but I'm hoping eventually that we'll be able to offer that service in the future. Um, right now, our library, we're using um, Destiny, but we found that we do need a good um, ILS, and we're working with um, Washington State Library to um, transition to COHA. So that's something that will help us um, access databases, things that are offered through Washington State Library and authenticate. So, but we are probably going to move to COHA. Thank you all. Um, the next question is for Christine and Mary at Shoalwater. Um, says, Christine, great stuff. Curious about the story of the library logo. That is a design from um, Earl Davis, the cultural director. Um, <clears throat> it's based off of a, a zoomorphic spoon that he carved. And that's um, also was um, uh, an interpretation of a traditional spoon that he had been studying um, for his art. And so um, it's just kind of uh, uh, <clears throat> one of those figures where uh, that's prominent in our art. Thank you. Um, next question starts with a comment. Um, hi, I tuned in about 10 minutes late, so perhaps this was covered, but I noticed that the speakers are using both the terms native and Indian, and I wanted to confirm whether both are acceptable. I had thought that Native American was the preferred terminology and would like to ask about this at the risk of seeming uninformed. Well, there's, I think it's just whatever, you know, the, the tribe prefers. Um, I know that a lot of people say uh, Native American, they say American Indian, or they say indigenous. Uh, and, and that's another thing that uh, Debbie Reese tries to explain on her blog. I think her preference is um, indigenous, but 
um, I think all of the terms, uh, I think those are just the main terms that um, you'll see it used in different uh, ways. And I think that tribes are pretty understanding of the different ways because uh, while about uh, Yakima Nation, like you'll even see it in like some of our um, literature, it says Yakima Indian Nation, but it wasn't, I'm not sure if Michael knows when they exactly uh, dropped the word Indian in it. And then we just went to Yakima Nation, but you'll still see it referred to as Yakima Indian Nation. But, in, and you know, we, uh, I don't think we really take offense to it, but, um, you know, I say Native American, um, indigenous, um, but usually drop the word Indian in any kind of uh, reference to tribes. That was fairly recent too. Um, Yakima Indian Nation was the official name of the Confederated Tribes and Bands for a long time. So we've seen it in print all the way up through the 90s. And I would think, forgive me for not having the correct dates, but I imagine it was the early 2000s that the, the, the full transition was complete. Um, myself personally, and I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about the, the media that I make and the media that I come across. Um, I kind of feel like using art as a, as a uh, as the foreground, I've seen a lot of folks in literature. I'm reading the "There, There" by uh, oh. people. People throw around the word Indian, um, you know, as a pejorative, but it, it also like speaks to a, a bit of history too. So I think um, I, I I almost say <laughs> um, I'm gonna just be risky, but like it's almost like the N word, really. <laughs> I've heard a lot of my peers throw it around the same way. So it gets mixed in with creativity and the music and, and the pop culture. So it is really a, a, an interesting discussion. So I, I think about it that way too. Mary, do you have anything? I, oh. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say that, yeah, it's just, it depends on the community. And for us, um, our official uh, tribal name is Shoalwater Bay Indian Tribe. Uh, but for the most part, our communities just kind of drop the Indian part. And um, we just say Shoalwater Bay Tribe when we're talking, when we're referring to ourselves. And um, yeah, it's just, it's personal and uh, community driven what the preference is. So I just wanted to throw in something that uh, conversation at a conference one time when someone said our treaties use the word Indians, not Native Americans. He also said that uh, he preferred Indians because Native Americans was also a jingoistic group in the 20s, 1920s, and sort of white supremacist stuff. So I, I agree entirely. It's individual and community preference. And there's a lot to be said. You know, ask the person. Tribal names, if you have a tribal name, that is frequently preferable to one of the broader terms, but yeah, ask the person. Thank you all. Um, okay, another question. Um, sorry for my ignorance, but I know nothing about tribal libraries. So I'm wondering, are tribal libraries within reservations and not available for use by the outside community? That's going to depend on the library too, but I can tell you that that the Lummi Library is open to anybody who walks in the doors. Anybody can come in and use materials. We also will give borrowing privileges to pretty much anybody that wants them. Uh, we've got we've got card holders in Anacortes and some other places, uh, but that's that's what we do here. I'm not speaking for all tribal libraries at all and we are open um, we're open fewer hours than we used to 
and at less capacity, but we're open eight to five Monday through Friday and would love to have any of you come visit. We're open to the public as well. Um, I think that was part of the uh, reason for the name of our library, community, tribal community library was to emphasize that it wasn't just ours, that we were offering it to, you know, um, anybody that wanted to come in and use it. Um, <clears throat> same thing with us, we have card holders that live in Seattle. Um, they have cabins, you know, down here in Westport or Toakland that they will come for the summer. And so, yeah, if you want to come in and check out a book or you just want to come in and read for a little while or um, just, you know, sit in, in the quiet and, you know, look out the back window where the bay is. I mean, it's whatever you want to do, you're welcome. And the Yakima Nation, we're, we also were a public uh, tribal library, and we are uh, also a branch of the tribal high school and the tribal Head Start centers. But uh, the main difference is our library is uh, managed by our tribe, and um, we're trying to, we are public, but we want to be a platform where um, if you want to educate yourself about uh, Yakima Nation, probably the first place you should come is to our tribal library where we can, you know, give you um, first person knowledge about the tribe without that information being, you know, um, distorted by um, what is in textbooks right now. So that's why we have uh, cultural presentations, um, storytelling where people of all ages, they, you know, we set the atmosphere where um, it's a free open discussion to where um, kids may have their own stereotypes of what they think about the tribe and they can ask those questions. And our stories, they're, our storytellers, they're pretty awesome about um, answering those questions and making it so it's not an awkward uh, conversation, but yeah, that's where, um, if anyone's trying to learn about tribes, they should go to the tribal libraries. And, you know, I think a majority of them are public, but, you know, like Valerie said, I can't speak for all of them, but that's kind of what our main basis is. We're managed by our tribe, and that's what we're trying to um, give the information about, specifically about our tribe. But we have a variety of just general services that anyone can participate in. Thank you all. I've um, just got a few more questions. Um, the next one is how do the tribal libraries communicate and connect with each other in Washington? Uh, I know Washington State Library organizes a workshop for tribal libraries. Is there anything else happening? Thank you. I'm not sure of anything that, I mean, we kind of network with each other. Um, <clears throat> we just kind of know about each other and reach out to each other. Um, <clears throat> there used to be something through um, the Washington State Library that was Keepers of the Stories, where we would um, all get together and um, kind of report with each other on what's been going on. and. Um, I think the last one that I attended was at the Yakima uh, Tribal Library, and I got to see their facility and I was really excited. Um, but other than that, I'm not, sh I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, we participate with the uh, um, Carolyn Peterson she, from the Washington State Library. She's the uh, tribal libraries uh, liaison and she does a good uh, job of connecting us all and you know she'll she'll uh, arrange meetings for us all to do like online discussions or um, in-person meetings she probably can't wait to start those in-person meetings again but then also there's um, ATOM um, conferences uh, nationally and Sarah just put up the link and um, that's where um, tribal libraries and museums and archives uh, have conferences and we um, meet and talk about um, current issues and things that projects to work on. Okay. Um, 
Let's see, the first part of this question already got answered about in-person access, but the second part um, is asking about the accessibility of your digital archives and whether, um, I think you've touched upon this a little bit, but. So Showwater does not have digital archives currently, correct? Yeah. Lummy doesn't either. Happening in the future, I hope, but uh, not currently. Uh, we are working on some digital archives with the Plateau People's Portal out of uh, Washington State University. Um, there are some things that um, may be culturally sensitive. So that's one good thing about the portal is um, it helps us to set parameters on things that maybe that are tribally specific that relate to something that's traditional or you know things like that but then there are things that are going to be public um, and that will be accessed uh, publicly through the plateau people's portal um, it's still a work in progress so i wouldn't say it's completely open but um, there are some areas that are open from other tribes neighboring tribes that are um, also participating in the portal and um, michael he's the one that um, one of the people that's working on uh, getting things uploaded, but, but the newspapers, they will be public. Um, another question for the Yakima Nation, is the usage of your mobile library van popular? How often and where does it travel? Oh, the, um, our little bookmobile that was uh, grant funded through the IMLS, uh, we were able to get an enhancement grant. So, um, we had just got, you know, the van modified and the shelves installed, and uh, we were um, ready to hit the road. And then the pandemic hit, so we had routes that were going to the different um, tribal housing communities. And then um, after we um, successfully had those routes, then we were going to go to the uh, to like George and uh, Salilo and then bring our van down there. But right now we're, um, you know, we, we've been closed ever since the beginning of the pandemic. So we haven't um, actually brought it on the route. You know, we were just arranging the, with the different organizations saying, hey, can we come through? And then, you know, it was, it was the strangest thing, but hopefully in July, you know, our van will hit the road and get the accessibility and things that going but that was that was the big thing was uh, when we shut down was just wondering what what how all of our patrons are accessing the internet and books and things like that but but yeah they see it parked out there and they're curious about it so i'm pretty sure it'll be very popular nice and one last question came in um, are there any suggestions of ways non-tribal libraries can support and ally with tribal libraries so we strengthen our state service network for all users. Oh yeah, I would say um, if you have a neighboring tribal library, you know, contact them, reach out to them, see if they want to um, partner, um, give them some ideas of maybe a project you're working on. I know um, we've do, we've done some partnerships with um, Central Washington University, the Brooks Library, uh, the Yakima Valley Regional Library. Uh, they reached out to us. Um, Wenatchee Library. Um, they they shared some resources before we um, started our bookmobile. They invited us to their little owls meeting, and we got to uh, see where they had all the bookmobiles set up in the um, parking lot. So that's one of the things that, um, you know, reach out and see if your neighboring uh, tribal library is open to that. And because I know that the Central uh, Washington University, the Brooks Library, uh, we had got a grant and from ALA, uh, the Book of Palooza, and we just had boxes of boxes of books uh, show up. And they, they were nice enough. They volunteered today as a part of their community outreach to help us catalog those books and get them out on the floor. So, you know, that's one way you can outreach and say, you know, um, what do you need? <laughs> or they might need help, you know, just writing a grant or something. But 
Um, but I'm also open to that too. You know, I offer that to any library who wants to partner or needs um, any kind of input on my programming or assistance setting up their programming. So it goes both ways. So, you know, feel free to contact me any of you. <laughs> Well, thank you uh, everybody for your quest for your wonderful questions and thank you to our panelists for all the great information and again for your tours. So we're at the part of our um, one of the, the great parts of the library crawls is just having an opportunity to um, socialize with your uh, library colleagues and we realize that um, not everybody is going to be able to stick around so I just want to uh, incorporate an announcement really quick before we head uh, before Laura G sorts us into our breakout rooms for a little socializing. Um, we do have one more library crawl this year it's going to be in September on um, and we will be giving you more information about that when we get all of our presenters set. But the theme for the next library crawl in September is going to be fine arts libraries. So we're really looking forward to touring some fine arts libraries and we hope that you join us again. So, um, you know, be sure to check out our website, uh, keep an eye on the different announcement platforms from SLA, PNW and SLD. And we'll get you some more information about that as soon as possible. So without Without further ado, we only we do only have a few minutes, but we do want to um, get to know everybody a little better. So, Laura G, would you please sort us into our breakout rooms? Certainly. Thank you, Laura E. And I've been working on that, and I have the preliminary setup underway. Looks like there's quite a few people who unfortunately can't stay with us. So, everyone who is here. Thank you so much for attending. And if you need to leave now, we hope to see you at the next one. So then when our list stabilizes just a little bit here and we have everyone staying who is going to stay, then I'll open all the breakout rooms. And I think we'll have about 10 minutes for our breakout rooms. And at the end of it, I'll bring everyone back to the main room and there will be a notification in your breakout room that that's happening. You also can leave the breakout room and return to the main session at any time if you want to. I will still be in the main session. When I switch everyone into their rooms, I'm not sure if it's going to do it automatically or if it's going to ask you to accept. Hopefully you'll accept. My plan is to have about four people to a room. So I'm just making some really quick adjustments to the rooms based on the remaining participants. And fortunately, Zoom's pretty good about moving people from room to room. Also, okay, let's see. I and I want, to, I would like to offer a special thanks to again to our presenters and to our friends at SLA PNW, um, Laura G, Laura D, and Eva and to my fellow leadership team members at WLA SLD, Judy and Sarah for their partnership and all of their work, hard work to put this event on. So I'm gonna say goodbye and we will see you all in September. Have a wonderful summer, everybody. Thank you, bye. Bye.